So today's speaker today is uh, Jamie Teven. She's a principal researcher at Microsoft Research and also an affiliate faculty at University of Washington. Um, Jamie's research at the intersection of HCI, information retrieval, and crowdsourcing has made a great impact at Microsoft as well as beyond Microsoft. Um, she's won a number of awards, including the MIT Technology Review Young Innovator Award and the Borg Early Career Award. And we're very happy to have her here today. Thank you. Hey. Thanks, it's nice to be here. I don't have a microphone on in the room, so if you can't hear me in the back, like wave and scream at me and I'll talk louder. Uh, so I'm really excited to be giving this talk today about microproductivity because it's a new talk that I haven't given yet. So it's fun for me to get to share this sort of new stuff that I'm really excited about. Um, so make sure you stop me if something's a little bit unclear because it's not quite as polished as usual as well. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about work that our team at Microsoft Research is doing and this is a, a bunch of the people on the team in particular. Uh, a lot of good work by AJ Kamar, Shamsi Iqbal, Dan Liebling, myself and not pictured Christina Tutanova, uh, Andres Monroy Hernandez and Justin uh, Cranshaw. So this is representing a large research agenda that we've had over the past couple of years. And the reason that we're coming together is to try and address sort of the problem depicted in this picture. So we all have this challenge where we think in order to get something big done, we need a good solid chunk of time in the day to get that done. And that never happens in practice. So uh, research shows that it takes 25 minutes for us to get up to full productivity, and yet we're interrupted every 11 minutes. So that means we're never working at full productivity. And even when we're not interrupted by external forces, we self-interrupt. So when you look at the windows that people look at on their desktop computer, you see that they focus on each given window only 20 seconds. And we're, we're interrupting to go check Facebook or check email or to look at different things, or go browse the web. And we also all try to multitask. And we know that multitasking is a complete failure. So this kind of lack of attention or focus on everything was really useful for us when we were hunters and gatherers and had to like attend to predators who were about to attack us. But in the safety of our own offices, it's kind of amazing that we managed to get things done. Many of the little micro moments that we have free are not ones where we're at a desk, so they're even harder to use. So just think about the few minutes that you had as, while we were waiting for this talk to start. It was not an easy time for you to use productively, but you could have done something useful. And those little moments that people have in their day actually add up. If you look at the number of times, people spend 200 minutes playing Angry Birds, 200 million minutes playing Angry Birds every day. So this is sort of worldwide. And if we were able to take that time that people are currently spending uh, shooting little pigs, we could do something like in 18 days release the equivalent of Microsoft Office. So we try to defrag our time by turning off our email or taking vacations from Facebook or blocking time on our calendar. And that doesn't ever work really well. Rather than try to change the way that we work, basically trying to change fighting our kind of old instincts and these modern distractions, what we're proposed doing, what we're trying to do, is instead change the task to fit into the way that we actually do work. And we call this microproductivity, or the transformation of large productivity tasks into small micro tasks that are quick and easy to do. And this is essentially what every kind of pop time management book is telling you to do. They'll say, break your task down into small actionable steps, only put the thing that's the next thing to do on your list and do that. The difference is we're starting to be able to do that algorithmically, both break the tasks down and surface the tasks to you. And that means we can get these tasks down to things that were much smaller than previously imaginable, rather than you maybe putting a half hour task down on your list. You know, oh, I want to work on the introduction of this paper that I'm doing. You can put these little five second tasks on your list because you're not managing the computers. It could be like write one sentence uh, or something like that. And we believe that this transformation, this micro productivity transformation is going to change the way that we work personally. And it's also going to change the way that we work with other people because you can start sharing these tasks with other people. And you can start automating some of the micro tasks as well. And so there's sort of four key aspects of micro-productivity uh, that we think are important. The first 
is task structure or how we break tasks down into microtasks. The second is task completion, making it easy to do microtasks. The third is task sharing, getting the task to the right person. And the fourth is, fourth is task automation. Today, I'm going to focus on the uh, first three, task structure, task completion, task sharing, and I'll leave task automation uh, to another visit. Um, so in, yeah. Can you say in your model what this productivity means? When you said, you know, it takes 25 minutes to reach full productivity, is there, is there a metric or is there? Yeah, that's where you're getting everything done. So it's sort of, you spend, you, you get interrupted from a task. How long does it take for you to get back into that task and be working kind of where your full head's into that task versus you're like, oh, I should be working on this task, but I'm going to check email a little or I'm going to not be, I'm, it's not, the context isn't swapped in. Um, yeah. Yes. But it's different, actually. So full productivity, these are thinking about large, complex tasks. And it's very different to think about what full productivity looks like when you're doing a 30-second task. And, and that's sort of like what's at the core of a lot of this work. Um, so I'm going to talk about the state of the art in terms of what we know about task structure and how you can take large tasks and break it down. And I'll give some, there, I'll give some examples of how you can break complex tasks. Um, kind of emerging, exciting things are thinking about workflow creation. How do you break tasks down um, in a reusable way? How do you compose and reuse the breakdowns? And also context maintenance. How do you help people maintain where they are? In task completion, I'm going to talk about where we are right now in understanding about what's the impact of microtasks on your productivity and on how you get things done. Uh, there's a lot of interesting emerging work or work that needs to be done to understand uh, how we apply a workflow, how we understand the right, right workflow to, um, to apply, and also prioritizing microtasks, getting the right tasks to a person at the right time. In the context of task sharing, we're going to look at how uh, micro productivity reduces the overhead in sharing tasks with other people, with your colleagues, and also with crowd workers. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work kind of really just starting to emerge about task allocation, getting tasks to the right person. And then finally, uh, with task automation, we know that it's possible to incorporate automation into workflows. I'm not going to show you, but we have some good evidence about that. And there's a, uh, interesting emerging models of where I, AI systems um, can start doing, start, start to integrate in there. So I'm going to get started with task structure. And uh, this is looking at how to break tasks down into microtasks. And I'm going to talk about it in the context of writing because our team has been really interested in writing as sort of a model productivity task. And we chose the writing partly because writing comprises a lot of important aspects that apply to other types of information work. You know, you need to read, you need to synthesize, you need to communicate, you need to organize. Uh, all of those tasks, all of those kind of subcomponents apply to other kinds of information work. Writing is also really interesting because of uh, some of the challenges that it has. One thing Jim and I were talking earlier um, about enjoying something that's kind of controversial or that people don't really believe in. It makes for interesting research. And one thing is people don't believe you can decompose writing. It's something that people sit there and they say, no, that's not how I write. That's not going to work. And so it's a fun one to try because if it works, people will kind of find it magical. Uh, it's also really hard to outsource. So writing is one of those things that really does require personal knowledge. I couldn't ask any of you to go sit down and write what I did today because you don't have that knowledge that you need to do for that. And writing's hard to do. It's something that we find challenging. So everybody's probably familiar with this basic experience of an empty Word document. And you think, oh my goodness, how do I get started? Uh, and so we have some, you know, we can start turning to crowdsourcing to look at how to decompose common writing tasks. I suspect a number of you are familiar with the Soylent, which is a workflow for copy editing text. And, uh, you know, it sort of introduces the find, fix, verify paradigm for going through text and improving it. But that doesn't really do us all that much good when we're thinking about starting with a blank slate. Um, but there's been actually um, a number of interesting Projects in this space, Eventful, looks at using crowd workers, breaking down the task of writing news stories, local news stories, by having some task rabbit workers go and attend an event, and other people in the crowd create listicles from the content they create um, to, to structure creating uh, news, local news stories. 
Uh, this work, Crowdforge by Nikki Couture, as well as a bunch of other work by his team, and actually Stephen, I think you're involved in the Crowdlines work, and um, the knowledge acquisition, I forget exactly what it is, um, are, are various different ways of helping the crowd collaborate to create uh, encyclopedic information uh, in many cases. Uh, there's this work that we've done on uh, where write, looking at how to support writing in structured ways, uh, writing uh, from a watch in structured ways, and Joy Kim has done some interesting work on creative writing. So all of these are great workflows that are used in the crowd. And with microproductivity, what we're sort of challenging all of us to think about is like, what about if this isn't something that we're just using to get crowd workers to work together and create content, but we start thinking about what does it mean for me myself to use that when I want to write something? And so we went and just kind of said, okay, there's all this great work, let's just borrow one of these structures to create uh, a, an approach for writing new content. And one thing that comes out from all these systems is you see pretty consistently there's actually three components. The first component is about collecting content. You have to gather the information that you actually want to include in your written material. The second is you have to organize the content, create some structure uh, from that content. And then the third is you have to turn the content into, um, into a written material. And so we went and implemented a very simple version of these three steps. And I'll just take us through it real quickly just so that we have sort of in our minds a concrete notion of what microproductivity for content generation might look like. Uh, and this is a system we built called the MicroWriter. So the first thing that MicroWriter does is it tries to create, to, to get you to uh, brainstorm content. And this is just basically a form somewhere where you go and type in some ideas and hit submit. And so here we're writing about the MicroWriter. This is very meta. So we might say, oh, the MicroWriter breaks writing into microtasks. This is a bunch of different ideas that we've entered in different places. We do it in a little form that looks like this. Uh, and so that's collecting our content. And then we want to turn that content into, actually write, into actual writing and we borrow from uh, Lydia Chilton's Cascade work, which is a bottom-up crowdsourced way of organizing content. They have three steps where they basically have people assign labels to the content, reduce the label space to only come up with the important labels, and then go through every piece of content and assign a canonical label to it from that. So those three steps we mimic in the microwriter. They're basically the same. And the way that it looks in practice is we have this idea, which is, oh, microtasks can be shared with collaborators. And we assign a bunch of different labels to it, like maybe collaboration, microtask, and tasks. That's the first step. The second step is merging the labels to come up with a canonical set of labels. So you might merge microtask and tasks. Other ideas will also have some labels, so mobile might be another label that emerges in this process. And then we just go through all of the ideas that we collect, and for each one we say, does collaboration label apply to this? Does the microtask label apply to this? And does the mobile uh, microtask? And so we end up with a bipartite graph that looks like this. And then the final step, once we've got that organization, is to actually turn the content into writing. And to do that, we want to get each, we want to give you small clusters of ideas that you can turn into paragraphs. So we use this bipartite graph to create a really simple structure where we start, we start by saying we want each paragraph to contain roughly the same number of ideas. So we go to the label with the least number of ideas and assign those ideas. So we'll assign the mobile only has two ideas. So we give mobile, the mobile label those two ideas. Uh, the next one is collaboration, only has three ideas associated with it. We give it to that, and we give the rest to this microtask label. We order, it's just, a, you know, it's a, it's a simple algorithm. Like, understanding the details of how this works isn't that important, except for that what that does is it essentially then just allows us to group these ideas into things that seem reasonably coherent. So we've got a bunch of ideas related to microtasks, saying the microwriter breaks writing into microtasks, structure turns big tasks into a series of small microtasks. All of this is done. All of this is done in just five to 10 second bursts. And then we might ask you to write a paragraph for one of these small clusters. So for the collaboration label, I'm asked to write a paragraph for these three ideas. Microtasks can be shared with collaborators. Collaborative writing typically requires coordination. Collaborators can be known or crowd workers. And the paragraph that I went and turned those three ideas into is collaborative writing typically requires coordination. However, microtasks are easy to share with collaborators without the need for coordination. 
The collaborators can be known colleagues or paid crowd workers. And when you put all the paragraphs that are written together, you get a, a complete story. And it's not perfect. You know, here we've got something about like, oh, these micro moments, the mobile micro moments. Maybe that would be better when we're start starting um, the earlier paragraph. But it's, it's, it gets you over that kind of blank slate um, hump to actually have content that you can start working with. And if you want to see, you know, and we've used this to write real content. Um, oh, this is the micro writer. Uh, but we've used it to write uh, the discussion section that is in the microwriter paper is actually written that way. I've written blog posts that way. Uh, people at, in our lab have found it really successful for writing rebuttals, because it's perfect as you're like kind of reading the reviews from reviewers and you have like, oh, I want to respond to it this way. So you sort of generate all the responses you might want to have to a reviewer. And then this bottom up structure emerges that allows you to group them together and write them. Um, and have actually had their papers accepted after rebuttals like that. So that's a little bit about like what it might look like to break the process of writing down into small little tasks. Yeah? Uh, when, for those examples you just gave, was the crowd enlisted to no. target? Was right this is entirely in-house, it's your own. It might be small groups that said like you and I co-authored a paper together, uh -huh. so we would go write the rebuttal together. This was the co-authors on this paper, wrote the discussion section. I'm going to talk about the collaboration piece okay. soon because it's really cool. I mean, it's interesting. Normally we'd be like, you write the discussion section, I'll write the introduction, but all of a sudden we're writing ideas that are, end up in the same paragraph. And it's kind of cool that way to get that real. Um, and then thinking about the whole crowd is a whole nother bucket as well. Um, so this is a little bit about what it might look like to break down. And I think that's important to have that notion of what these micro tasks will look like as we dive into how we get them done and how we share them. Um, so let's th think a little bit about task completion. Why would we want to do this? Uh, you know? So we, we wanted to run a study. We ran a study that compared micro tasks to macro tasks. What's it like to do a task? And you know, what would it be like to sit down and write a blog post on its own versus do it using this structured format? Um, but we wanted to take, we started with slightly smaller tasks just to be a little bit more controlled. And so this is an example of a common task you might see on uh, Mechanical Turk, which is adding a bunch of items on a receipt uh, to, it, to find the total. And the macro task on, uh, might look like this. What is the total cost of all of the items on the receipt? If you were to break that down into microtasks, there you don't even have to think about it. We don't have to rely on crowdsourcing literature. We can just figure it out. You know, it might be just to add one line at a time. So we'll say, this is the previous total, this is a new item, and we say add the cost of the new item to the previous total. So you'd add 0 and 22, and you'd get 22. But of course, that's not the same as adding all 10 items on the receipt. You have to do it 10 times, so you have to go again and add the next thing. It's a series of microtasks is what this task becomes. And so we took a number of common, obviously decomposable tasks and created a macro task implementation and a micro task implementation. So there was this adding, this arithmetic one, there was one that looked at sorting items, complex items, and then there was finally one that required uh, transcription. And the first thing that jumped out at us as we were doing these is that people found it so much easier to do tasks via micro tasks. 77% of the people that uh, tried out doing tasks one way or the other preferred to do it in micro tasks over as a macro task. And the NASA TLX scores were lower. It was just in general a much easier task for people to do. Uh, it was also uh, m more robust. Yeah? Do you ascribe that to just being easier, or is it also because the tasks seem to be boring? <laughs> um, well, I think all the tasks, I think they're both boring. <laughs> yeah, but in my class, I don't suffer from the issue of having to look at the whole thing at once and then knowing that in the next five minutes I'm going to be spending this much time on this boring task, which might affect how my, I might think about that task. In the micro task model, I just go ahead and like do one. And just do it. They were told up front that they would be doing 10 of these tasks. So they do see, um, you can see sort of here. Yeah, actually you can see it here or there, that it will tell you where you are. So there may be something there, but yeah, no. I, there's many reasons to think about it. I think it's just having done this myself, it's easier. Um, but it's not surprising to me, like they're, they're both boring too. But, um, you know, trying to add up 10 numbers is just harder than doing pairwise additions. Um, 
We did see that you also get fewer errors, and this is almost certainly because you're externalizing a lot of the processing that's going on in your head. You know, trying to add up 10 numbers, that's all happening in your head or you're writing it down somewhere else, whereas when you're doing it in pairwise pieces, um, that's, that's uh, so you see very consistently that uh, we see fewer errors. Of course, all of this goodness uh, comes at a cost, and that's that doing things via microtasks takes longer. So here you can see the arithmetic when it's done via microtask versus macrotask takes longer, the sorting takes longer, transcription actually doesn't particularly take longer, but the other tasks uh, do. And that's because there's overhead in trying to do, you know, you're doing, um, you might ha you're, you're having to do some structural um, overhead there. So when you look at it on average, you see maybe the, um, the macrotask took about 100 seconds and the microtask maybe 135 seconds. An interesting thing happened though when you started thinking about doing these tasks in real world context, because the whole thing that, the whole reason that's motivating this isn't because you're sitting down and doing a task all at once, you're thinking about doing it in a real world. So we went and interrupted people while they were doing their tasks. And we would sit and ask people, okay, can you tell us what 69 plus 79 is? And we had a bunch of answers with some distractions. This is a really common way to study interruptions um, in the kind of interruption attention management space. And so we'd sit and interrupt people and when we did this, we found, not surprisingly, that you increase the task time. And we're excluding the amount of time spent on interruptions. So people do the interruption, go back to the task, and it's taking longer. And it's because of the sort of need to pick up context that we were talking about earlier. The interesting thing is when you look at the micro tasks, you don't see a similar increase in the amount of time that it takes. And that's because people are getting interrupted at task boundaries. And we know that task boundaries are much easier time to be interrupted. And they also have a very concrete next step to do once they're done being interrupted, which we also know is a successful way to deal with interruptions. So this is just one example of how these tasks are useful in the wild. Another way that these tasks are useful in the wild is actually you can start taking advantage of your micro moments where you're sitting around in other places and using them. So, you know, while you were sitting to wait for this talk to start, you very well could have, if you had a smartwatch on, maybe done a few tasks, a micro task, you would have had a very hard time trying to edit an entire document, but you might be able to um, say a small comment. So this is WhereWrite, which is a system that we uh, created to allow watch users to write from their watch. And the way that they did that is they did small micro tasks, but they couldn't do it all because you can't actually write an entire paper or something complex from your watch. They uh, did the micro tasks that shared their unique knowledge. And meanwhile, in the background, a bunch of crowd workers were at, who were at desktop computers were actually uh, doing a lot of the work. Uh, and we actually wrote a paper this way. You should go read the paper and check out, check out, uh, check out how, we, how we did there. Um, and, but it's a good segue in general to thinking about task sharing. So the reason that worked is because, you know, I need to be the one who's coming up with the research ideas and directing how that research paper is going from my watch, but I don't need to be the one that's turning the ideas into coherent text necessarily. And so other people who, who and I'm actually not even the right person to do that because I'm not at a desktop computer. The right person to do that is somebody who's at a desktop computer. And you can imagine sharing that with myself. I could do some tasks such that when I sit back down at my office, it's ready for me to be doing things. Or we could work with people who are at the desktop computer. The crowd is actually better suited to be doing those tasks than I am in that case. Um, so, you know, we've got where right is one example. Another example is this blog, uh, the microwriter that I talked about earlier. We used a lot, we've used a lot in collaborative settings in our lab. Um, like I mentioned, to write rebuttals or to write discussion sections or pieces of content. And so that's a different one. That one is working with unknown collaborators. This is really about known collaborators working together. Um, eventful, which we talked about earlier too, is looking at people again with very different expertise and skills. So you might need a task rabbit person who can attend an event, has information that another person who's an expert writer might need, whereas the expert writer is the one who actually creates the content. Um, so this is cool. One of the things, I'm not going to dive actually into the collaborative, the, the, um, what we learned about known collaborators, except to say that we did find that there was a decrease in coordination overhead and you get a much richer kind of meshing and you also get people feeling like they're all contributing much more evenly rather than feeling like some people feel like they're not getting heard and other people feel like they're carrying too much of the work. You get more collaboration in that way. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about working with crowd workers. Because it's sort of interesting to think about bringing crowd workers into your personal productivity tasks. And the challenge there is crowd workers aren't you. 
And so they don't know what you're talking about. They don't know what you're interested in. So we've looked at some ways to try and transfer context to the crowd. Um, I'm just going to give one example, which I think is kind of fun. And this is here, we're looking at this thing where we're trying to help people. We want crowd workers to help us shop. Okay? And I am shopping for salt shakers. And I don't really like that first salt shaker. I love this one of the little kids kissing. And I don't like the third one. And uh, it's pretty easy for me to be able to give my preference for a handful of salt shakers, but I don't want to look at all of the 10,000 salt shakers that Amazon has, so I want to pay the crowd to figure that out for me. Uh, one thing I can do is I can ask the crowd, I can show those examples and ask the crowd to guess. So how many people think, given those preferences, that I would like the grandparents kissing? Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> so yes, that would, it's pretty easy for people to extrapolate from that, that the grandparents kissing is something this person would like. Another way that we can do it is also is use a much more kind of on-demand collaborative filtering approach where we ask a bunch of other people to also rate these salt shakers and then we try and find the person who's most like us. Uh, and this is how like Netflix and Amazon do recommendations for you. The challenge is not enough people have rated salt shakers or my personal photo collection or whatever I may particularly care about for this to be useful. So here we go, we collect this, we find that person's most similar, they give it a rating of three stars so we can be like, oh yes, this is also something that I'm gonna like as the grandparents kissing. Uh, and so when we've looked at this, what, uh, comparing the two of them, one thing that we find is we pretty much always, either approach, either usually asking people to guess or rate um, preferences, always does better than the baseline, but we find that there's some interesting differences uh, based on the particular task. When we look at salt shakers, guessing does the best, whereas when we look at food, rating does the best. And this is partly, it's very hard to guess people's food preference. It's much easier, like salt shakers, you can be like, oh, they like a classic style. Food is much more complex because you like pad thai. Does that mean you're gonna like barbecue? I don't know, that's a harder thing to, for people to extrapolate. Um, so with guessing, we found that there were benefits where it requires fewer workers. Uh, workers in general found it kind of fun. It was a little bit of a challenge, um, but that it was hard for us to capture complex preferences. Rating, the challenge is it requires many workers to find a good match. So these numbers that I'm reporting for right here are with five workers doing the rating or the guessing. When we go to 10 workers, guessing doesn't get any better, but the rating gets much better. And that's just because the more people you get, the more likely you are gonna get a match What's the number in the box? The number is the uh, root mean squared error. So you want it lower, lower is better. Yeah, sorry, I should have said that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so rating requires many workers to find a good match. It's relatively easy for workers because they're just giving you your opinion. They're not trying to look at you and extrapolate anything. They just have to tell you what they like. And the, it's also nice because the data is reusable. Once I've collected this for salt shakers, if Stephen wants to come in and get a salt shaker, he can go and match with that same data set. Uh, another thing that's sort of fun about this is, you know, this is looking at a pretty typical collaborative filtering kind of um, space. You can, once you're using people though, you can do things that algorithms can't as much. So I like the um, handwriting imitation example. So here we had somebody write, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And our task is uh, to go write wizard's hex. And we want to basically, this is like you want your, uh, your doctor's notes so that you can skip out of school or you know, <laughs> sort of trying to mimic, mimic things here. And so when we do this via rating, you could just imagine asking a bunch of people to write wizard's hex. That's just sort of the way, the way we ask a bunch of people to do it and we try and see if any of them look like the original sample. And the thing is, this is terrible. Only about 13% of the handwriting things that people do ever look like the original sample because we all just have very different handwriting. Honestly though, the original person who wrote that, we only guessed 83% of the time that it was the same thing. So we, you know, crowd workers are kind of inherently skeptical that any of the text looks like it. Um, so rating's not a good approach for this kind of task. Guessing, on the other hand, ends up to be pretty good. So when we ask people to try to imitate this text, then we get, we, we only need to ask about five people to get a pretty accurate and high quality imitation. So this is, we've asked five people and we've got a um, couple good imitations in there. We've also got, I put a six one in with the actual original uh, handwriting person who wrote the thing. So take a guess, which one do you think it is? Bottom middle. Bottom middle? Bottom left? Bottom right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you, I, 
one, this is when I look at it, this is one I think it is. Uh, the one that it actually is, is the one, and the reason this is so weird too is like it's a different Z. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I think, you know, there's some interesting things. I think people start getting like they're writing with like harder pen strokes when they're trying to copy because you're doing it a little slower. Um, but I thought that was a really fun example. Um, but there's also, so, so we can get crowd workers to act like you, to write your papers like you, to write notes like your doctor. What we, uh, th there's also a risk to using crowd workers though, because this is other people seeing your stuff. You know, and I'm about, like, I'm writing a love note. Do I want some random stranger to see that? There's a risk of like having information get extracted by the crowd. Um, so we've done a bunch of, Studies also trying to get a sense of how likely, how at risk are we having our personal tasks done by the crowd. We looked at two different kinds of risks. One, which is the extraction risk. risk. How likely if I write a paragraph that I consider very personal and proprietary, might a crowd worker go and take it and use it if there's some benefit to them to do it. And then the other is manipulation risk. How likely could, could would somebody do something to uh, screw up a task that I'm working on? Um, so let's start with looking at uh, task extraction. And so this is sort of an interesting experimental design, so I want you to stay with me a little bit as we go over this. Um, so a very common task on Mechanical Turk is uh, text recognition or text extraction. So like, I might show this picture of this credit card and they would ask you, uh, could you please write down the text for that? And that, that's what that would look like. And then what we did was we created a second task that's entirely separate from the target task. Doesn't look like, looks like it's from a different person. And we gave this target attack task and we said, go complete the target task. So we pointed them to this other person's task, said go complete it, and then go tell us what you told them. Right? So it's, it's a little bit sketchy. And uh, how many times do you think people were willing to do this? Do you think more than 50% of the people were willing to do this? We found that 62% of people were willing to go to another task and return us that information. But you know what? This looks kind of like a fake credit card. We also went and took a credit card that looks more like a real credit card where you start worrying about the kind of information that would contain a little bit more. And when we did this, we found the number, not surprisingly, dropped. But it didn't drop down to zero. It dropped down to 32%. So we've got about one third of the people who are willing to do this, even when it seems like you might be doing something you know, not appropriate, and two-thirds of the people willing to do it as long as it seemed uh, reasonably appropriate. We ran a very similar setup to understand how people would manipulate tasks. So here we did again task recognition. This time we started with this piece of text. What do you guys think this says? <laughs> how many people think, what, what? Guns. How many people think gun? How many people think fun? How many people think sun? Yeah, so it's, it, people think it's all sorts of things. Uh, this is what we got when we just ran this as a kind of raw, give us text recognition. Uh, the true answer is fun, for what that's worth. Uh, <laughs> um, so we had this, and then we, so we took it and we said, okay, sun is, sun is plausible, but the least common one, right? We went and had our attack tasks, pointed them to the target task, and this time we said, please go enter the term sun for that target task, and we measured how often they did that. So it would look like that, we'd ask them to go do that, and we found 75% of people were willing to do that. And you know, some of that could be malicious, and some of that could just be you're primed. So you go and see that test, Somebody's, if I had said, I'm gonna show you the word sun, and then I showed you this, you'd probably think I was gonna show you that it was the word sun. So we took also something where it clearly doesn't say sun. We use this word that says length, and we asked people to go and enter the word sun. And when we did that, we found that 28% of the people were still willing to do that. And it's kind of interesting, actually. So what we found was there was sort of this trend in general of, again, about a third of the people are willing to do anything as long as I'm paying them. <laughs> and two-thirds of the people are willing to do it kind of contextually as long as it seems reasonable and OK. Um, and so we tried exploring it. We found that same thing happen, actually, when we started manipulating the price of the tasks as well. So with the when the target task was paying five cents and the attack task was paying five cents, which is sort of how all of our experiments were run, you see, uh, and this is in one of the conditions, I think it's in the text extraction with the credit card that looks real. You see that it's down around 32%. Um, 
which is, our, which is our one third of people are sort of willing to do anything. But the more that I start paying the, attack tack, the, the attackers, the more likely they are going to be. So you can see that that middle third of people who kind of are willing to do it if it feels okay, they're also willing to do it if it pays more, which is sort of interesting. So if you want to know the price of your, of your soul, it's <laughs> 45 cents. <laughs> um, uh, fortunately, the target task could actually uh, do some things to protect themselves. So we found if the target task paid more, if it paid a quarter, then people were less successful in attacking. And there's other ways too. If the target task says, please keep this information private, people are much more likely to keep it private as well. And I think there's all sorts of really interesting things we can start doing to think about, okay, we've got some people who are sort of mercenary and will do things as long as they're paying. We've got some people who are our ethical people who can maybe act as our canary in a coal mine and help us identify when a task has private information that we want to be aware of. And we can start thinking, about ways to play in that space. Um, so in summary, we've looked at microproductivity. Uh, we've explored task structure and uh, looked specifically at writing and breaking writing tasks down. And um, you know, with all, all of these great minds in the room, I'm hoping to inspire some people too to go tackle some of these problems. I think thinking more about workflow creation is a really interesting space and in how to compose and reuse them. That's what's really, I think, fortunately, the area is still new enough that we can do these sort of head common tasks, but we're, it'll eventually, we'll want to move down into the tail. Uh, looked at uh, task completion, making it easy to do micro tasks. We've seen that micro tasks are easier. They allow us to take care of our, take advantage of our micro moments. Um, but we need to be thinking about like, what's the right workflow to use? How do we apply it? How do we surface the right micro tasks at the right time in the right context to the right person? Uh, we saw that task sharing has, um, helps us reduce the overhead of collaborating with the colleagues and crowd. Actually, and that's not exactly what we talked about. We also talked about how um, we can identify crowd workers who are like us and some of the risks of working with the crowd. Uh, and there's really interesting problems remaining, thinking about task allocation, how we get tasks to the right people, um, and uh, how we support task marketplaces. And then finally, there's all sorts of great things. You know, What's cool is once you've got these tasks being done over and over again, you get great training data to start automating things. Um, and you can learn more at, um, through our website or via these publications. Thank you.